And thank you, all, all of you, for coming tonight. Canada right now is, feels like a very special place. Obviously, it's vast beauty, uh, the welcoming, multicultural nature of its society makes it stand out in the world when other people are drowning in difficulties and crises. This feels like a bit of a haven of hope. Canada is a, a good place to think about innovation, but I want to take a rather deeper view than is normally taken. This is about us, who we are, how we've come here, and where we're going. It's extremely exciting because at the moment, we are seeing to the very limits of the cosmos. We're understanding things we never believed we would. And our technologies are giving the ability to look after everyone. And yet, paradoxically and deeply ironically, at just the moment when we've reached such incredible capabilities, the world is engulfed in crises, uh, mostly of our own creation. Uh, there are anxieties, uh, there's a sense of instability, there are antagonisms between different countries, and all of these things. So I feel very, very fortunate to be engaged in a pursuit which is very pure and uh, very wonderful. Now, what do physicists do? Well, we love to play with equations like these, and they look a bit scary if you haven't spent years studying them. But all they are are really ways for us to tell stories in very precise, very logical ways. Stories about nature and how nature works. And by writing them in equations, we're able to make sure that they make sense at some level and to work out their predictions and then test those predictions against reality. But I want to reassure you that I'm not going to show you any more equations tonight. And in fact, you won't see any of the symbols again, except one. It's the ancient Greek symbol, psi. And it stands for something very mysterious in physics, the wave function. It's the basic entity in quantum physics. It governs every force, every object, every natural process, from the tiniest particle to the whole cosmos itself. And even Einstein, who helped to uncover its existence, was deeply troubled by what it is telling us about the world. So in this talk, I'll talk a little bit about Psi and the wonder of it. And I hope by the end of this evening, it's the one symbol on that blackboard that you'll feel a little bit closer to. In fact, in the talk, I'm going to try to use Psi as a bit of a metaphor as well for ourselves and for innovation. And it'll be a handy way to remember the key qualities which drive innovation in us. Let's talk a little bit about us and ourselves, because we're pretty strange and mysterious, too. Some of us are serious. Some thrive on comedy. Some declare their lives are lived as true profundity. And others claim they really live the real reality. I've sailed upon the seven seas and stopped in every land. I've seen the wonders of the world, not yet one common man. I know 10,000 women called Jane and Mary Jane. I've not seen any two who really were the same. I note the obvious differences between each sort and type, but we are more alike, my friends, than we are unalike. We are more alike, my friends, than we are unalike. Maya Angelou's poem captures so much about how unique we all are, as well as how much we have in common. One of our key qualities, which is of course the topic of tonight's lecture, is something that makes us specially unique. We're absolutely unique as a species because we can. <laughs> and it's true. Innovation is a bit of a buzzword these days. It's often used to describe companies making better products. The examples of innovation are multi-billion dollar successes or market disruptions. But I think innovation is something much deeper than that. It's a process rather than an outcome. It's something which we can build into our society, which, which can be taught and encouraged. And so innovation is really a part of who we are 
and where we're going. And that's a perspective I'm going to give you tonight. In fact, biological evolution is nothing but a set of innovations, all made by trial and error and survival of the fittest. And so innovation is actually built into our DNA. It's who we are. What makes us different and what makes innovation different today is that we can do it deliberately. We can plan, we can cooperate to change our world. And that's a very enormous power. Innovation is one of the most powerful things we know of in the universe. It's such a power, we have to use it responsibly. And we often don't. We pollute the environment. We create all kinds of uh, difficulties, not just for ourselves. We drive other species extinct. We even do things which threaten our own existence and all other life's existence. So these photos by Ed Bertinsky are both haunting and beautiful. They show us the downside of innovation, the destruction which innovation can wreak on our planet. But tonight I want to talk more about the positive side of innovation and how we can encourage it among ourselves. And so here are the main qualities which can drive innovation. The most fundamental is curiosity. And then, of course, is creativity. And then courage and collaboration. And these four C's will reappear throughout this talk. I think they're fundamental and underappreciated. And I'm going to give you examples of these qualities from my life and from physics, but that's not because I want to emphasize me, it's because I want to encourage all of you to think about yourselves and how these qualities played a role in your life and about the innovations which helped you come about and which inspire you. I had a very unusual childhood. My mother and father were activists in South Africa. Alongside Nelson Mandela and others, they were resisting a racist apartheid system. So they devoted themselves to the struggle and uh, it made our lives difficult. Uh, when my parents went to jail, it made me very unhappy. And even afterwards, they were so dedicated to uh, change that uh, us poor kids were a bit of an afterthought. But they really did succeed in changing the world. Uh, and I'm really proud of what they and their friends did to change their society. Uh, at the time, nobody talked in these terms, but I now see that they were social innovators. Now, as I mentioned, all of these struggles made me rather unhappy as a child, and we left South Africa as refugees when they came out of prison. And we moved to East Africa, to Tanzania. We saw the wonders of Africa, and we went on camping trips in the Ngorogoro Crater, near to Mount Kilimanjaro and the Olduvai Gorge, where early humans walked two million years ago. So when I was a kid, I loved to watch antlions making traps in the sand, conical traps to catch ants and dung beetles rolling balls of dung to a safe place where they could lay their eggs in. And I watched them for hours. And now you're watching them all too. <laughs> I marveled at how beautifully constructed they are and how they seem to know what they're doing. How did that come about? How do they know what to do? Well, <laughs> when I was in East Africa, I was lucky enough to go to a little primary school where I had a very special teacher. And her name was Miss Margaret Carney. And you can probably tell my feelings about her <laughs> from the <this> slide. <laughs> so she was a teacher who encouraged us to be curious and to play with things and try things out. She never drowned us with too many facts. She fostered creativity in her class rather than drowning it with rote learning and tests. And she encouraged kids to question everything and welcomed the questions that even she couldn't answer. And finally, she encouraged kids to work together 
to find answers themselves. Well, Miss Carney was a very special teacher who, uh, even though I was a difficult and somewhat troubled kid and was very no noisy and disruptive in class, you see, the problem is I was quite small and I had very big ears. <laughs> and so I was bullied and made fun of. And that made me a difficult personality, a little bit like today. <laughs> but she looked beyond all that and saw the potential in me. And so she had me do things like observing things carefully, making plans and maps of the school, and testing Archimedes' principle with jam jars and buckets of water. And through this, she nurtured uh, in me the idea of doing science driven by myself. And that's really where I owe my origins as a scientist. Thirty years later, I became a professor of theoretical physics in Cambridge, and I was overjoyed when I, uh, by good fortune, met uh, Margaret Carney again. And by that time, she'd moved back to Scotland, and she lived with her sister, who was her identical twin, and also a devoted teacher, they both shared a tiny apartment in Edinburgh. And uh, over tea and biscuits, Margaret Carney asked me what I was working on. I started to explain about string theory and cosmology and extra dimensions of space, and she waved all the details away. And she said, Neil, there's only one question which matters. What bind? <laughs> <laughs> But she is absolutely right. If there was a big bang, what did the banging? What brought everything into existence? And I've actually spent my scientific career trying to answer that question. And I now believe we're closer than ever to answering it. And I'm actually jumping up and down with excitement because I think we will answer it soon. And you may say it sounds preposterous to answer something so basic about our existence. But actually, our knowledge has been growing with stupendous speed and at an ever-increasing rate. And what we have learned recently about the universe is mind-boggling, absolutely mind-boggling. So let's retrace history a little and see what we knew in the Middle Ages or what we thought we knew in the Middle Ages. So this is our home and the moon. And at that time, we thought that we were the center of the universe and that everything revolved around us. But then the first scientists came along and showed that was wrong. That in fact, the Earth is just one of eight planets and many other objects orbiting the Sun in the solar system. And the Sun is one of nearly a trillion stars in our galaxy. And our galaxy, the Milky Way, is just one of a trillion galaxies we can see. The scales and the numbers are mind-boggling. But the deepest paradox of all is that all of this, this vast universe of ours, emerged from a tiny, brilliant point of light 14 billion years ago. What you're seeing on the screen is a representation of our universe. As we look outwards from the solar system out into space, we see further and further objects as they were longer and longer ago. The most distant object we can see, and the oldest, is the Big Bang itself. That's the white edge of the circle. So we can look back to the Big Bang, and we can see the universe as it emerged. We literally see the history of the universe. What came out of the Big Bang were little density variations that turned into galaxies and stars. And inside the stars, the chemical elements formed. But some of the stars exploded at a supernovae and flung those elements across space. We've learned that two neutron stars, which are basically the remnant of a supernova, merged. And when they merge, there's a cataclysmic event that results in the creation of even heavier elements, like gold and platinum. 
And so all these chemical elements were flung into space, and slowly, over billions of years, they collected into molecules and clumps and uh, dust and then rocks and rocky planets. And one of those planets, formed four and a half billion years ago, was orbiting its star at just the right distance to allow liquid water to condense into lakes and seas. And then, in a very gradual process, complex molecules coalesced into primitive life forms, like single-celled organisms. And through this process of blind innovation, life evolved and changed. Many different organisms developed. And finally, it resulted in plants and animals, and eventually, human beings, like you and me. So these human beings, you know, we're very strange. As far as we know, we're the only beings capable of abstract thought, of understanding the universe, of using that knowledge, and of innovating. It's an incredible power, and it's one we don't necessarily use very well. But we should, because we are truly amazing. And rather than being drowned by crises and noise and the stuff flowing at us from the internet, we should appreciate that and realize how far we have come, how much we have overcome, and the incredible future which lies ahead of us. So take one of our most basic abilities as living beings, the ability to see. Just think how far science and innovation has changed that ability. Well, before the 17th century, nobody ever had seen anything smaller than a speck of dust. But then a Dutch cloth merchant named Anton van Leeuwenhoek invented an extraordinary device. At first, he used it just to magnify the threads in the cloth that he sold. But when he put a drop of water into his microscope, he was amazed to discover a whole new world of little organisms swimming around. He didn't intend to found the science of microbiology, but he did. And by solving a very practical problem in a clever way, he ended up saving very many lives. Well, today we've come a long, long way from Van Leeuwenhoek's first microscope. And the first rule about microscopes is that the smaller the thing you want to see, the larger and more powerful the microscope must be. So the most powerful microscope we have ever made is the Large Hadron Collider in Switzerland. And this is 27 kilometers around and consumes as much electricity as a small city. That vast microscope has a magnification of one trillion times the magnification of Van Leeuwenhoek's microscope. Shows you how far we've come. And it was used to create and examine the Higgs boson, one of the tiniest particles we know of, a particle involved in the mechanism whereby all other particles gain their mass. And so, in those few centuries, you see how far our capabilities have come. Also in 17th century Holland, the telescope was invented. And its inventor, Hans Lippersche, described it in his submission to the patent office as follows. It's an instrument for seeing things far away as if they were nearby. Sounds very nice. <laughs> and he was awarded the patent. The telescope at that time allowed people to see planets and moons, and the observations they made completely changed our conception of the universe. If you think in terms of distances, uh, these early telescopes showed us the planets hundreds of millions of kilometers away. But our current telescopes show us the universe a trillion times further than that. So there's been a similar increase in our observational reach over these centuries. So the very smallest things we know, like the Higgs particle and the top quark, and all the neutrinos and quarks, and then there come neutrons and protons and atomic nuclei. And then as we zoom out 
Further still, we'll find molecules and DNA and chromosomes and living cells. And if we zoom out further, we find ants and mice and whales and elephants and human beings. Zooming out further, we come to planets and stars. And as we zoom out even further, we come to collections of stars, small galaxies, big galaxies, galaxies of all shapes and sizes. And zooming out further, we find clusters of galaxies. And then we come to the largest scale we can see, the size of the observable universe <laughs> enclosed by that white circle. Beyond that is a black region, which is the limit of everything we will ever be able to see. And you can see we're not far from that limit right now. Beyond that, indicated in the fuzzy picture, is a region of the universe which we will never, ever, ever be able to see. And the reason for that is because the dark energy is carrying it away from us so fast that any light emitted from there will never reach us. And where in all this does life fit in? It fits in the middle. If you take the geometric mean of the Planck length, the tiniest scale, and the dark energy length, the biggest scale, the geometric mean is exactly the size of a living cell. And so life is slap bang in the middle of the universe. That's where all the complexity is. Uh, the universe is very simple on the tinier scale and on the larger scale, which is very encouraging to physicists like me. So let's now look at a few of the innovators which made all this possible. Galileo, of course, was the person who used the telescope to examine the solar system and figure out what was going on with the planets going around the sun. He made observations of the moons of Jupiter, shown in his pictures here, and also the phases of Venus. And he realized the moons of Jupiter are orbiting Jupiter. And he realized the phases of Venus only make sense if the Earth, our vantage point, is going around the Sun, not if the Sun is going around the Earth. So this brought him into conflict with the Catholic Church, because they had argued for centuries that Everything, the universe and everything in it, revolves around us. And so they accused him of heresy and put him on trial by the Inquisition. He had the curiosity to ask questions for himself. He had the creativity to create the means to test his ideas. And he had the courage to resist uh, authority and dogma. And through his work... Uh, everything changed. In fact, Galileo is best known for um, his words about science itself. His really big realization is that the truth can be found out by anyone using reason and experiment, and that you don't need to follow the prevailing dogma or authority. In fact, you shouldn't. He also said he realized that mathematics is universal. Namely, one plus one is two, no matter where you come from. 200 years later, in Victorian London, another great innovator was born. He was a working class kid and had very little formal schooling. And he found employment as a printer's apprentice in London. But one day, his lucky break came. Somebody came and gave him a ticket to a public lecture by Sir Humphrey Davy, a renowned scientist and director of the Royal Institution. The young boy went to the public lecture and took notes, and he wrote the notes up into a 300-page book, which he bound in the print shop, and he then presented to Sir Humphrey. And to Sir Humphrey's credit, he employed the boy in his lab, um, making tea <laughs> and running errands for the great scientist. But the boy used his time very well. He learned things, and he started to do experiments for himself. And over time, his experiments became more and more interesting. Thirteen years later, that boy became the next director of the Royal Institution, Michael Faraday. 
Michael Faraday was known for his insatiable curiosity. He just loved tinkering with things and playing with chemicals. He invented the world's first electric motor and generator. He invented the process of electrochemical plating with chromium and very, very much else. And actually, he had no maths. It's worth knowing because of his education. His most important contribution was just a concept. He somehow realized through all of his experiments and playing around that there were invisible things in the world which were nevertheless very, very important. So I thought I want to show you these invisible things in a little experiment, much like Michael Faraday must have done. So this is ordinary packing tape. And um, I'm going to put it down here. It's too long. Let's take another piece. OK. So we put the packing tape on this table, and we rip it off. When we rip it off, it's obviously a bit of a violent process, and we know that atoms are like tiny solar systems with electrons going around them. So when we do something harsh on their surface, they're going to lose a few electrons or gain a few. And if we do the same thing to these two strips, they will be altered. They will have a net excess or deficit of some of the particles, electrons, making up atoms. So we just do that, and then we hold this up, and you will notice they don't want to go together, okay? And that's what uh, Faraday was studying, and he said, why are these two strips pushing each other apart? What's doing that? And whereas Newton would have said, it's just action at a distance. You know, this guy is pushing that. Faraday didn't believe that. He said, there must be something which is pushing on this tape. And that's something he called a field. A field is the means for everything to influence everything else. And that was Faraday's uh, insight. And at the time, he was actually scoffed at by his scientific contemporaries. They said, what are these invisible things? You know, this is mysticism. Fortunately for Faraday, there was a brilliant young uh, scientist in the making who was, a, who was a mathematical prodigy called James Clerk Maxwell. And Maxwell learned about Faraday's work and translated his intuition into equations. When he did it, he made one of the most amazing scientific discoveries of all time, because he realized what light is. And light itself is nothing but a pattern of electric fields, like the ones, one you just saw, and magnetic fields moving together across space. And when Maxwell understood that, he at the same time understood there could be other versions of light, like X-rays or radio waves, which would behave in a similar way. And so Maxwell predicted all these things right from the mathematical understanding. So let me turn now to another great innovator, this time a little later in the 19th century. Born Maria Sklodowska in Poland, she moved to Paris to study physics and maths when she was 23 years old. She faced a lot of discrimination. You can imagine a young Polish woman coming to Paris at that time. But she overcame that and was eventually awarded a doctorate in 1903, actually the first woman ever to be awarded a doctorate in France. And then later that year, she went considerably better because she won the Nobel Prize with her husband. And eight years after that, she went even better by winning a second Nobel Prize. The first one was in physics. The second one was in chemistry. And she is still the only person ever to have won Nobel Prizes in two different fields. Well, I'm talking, of course, about Marie Curie. Marie Curie studied radiation and realized its incredible potential for medical diagnosis. In fact, she helped to design vehicles which transported radiological equipment to the front lines in World War I to help battlefield surgeons. And the little vehicles were called Petite Curie, 
little Marie Curies, running around and helping everyone. So she was very dedicated to, uh, to seeing her science help uh, society. But Marie Curie is not often recognized for something even more basic. You see, she saw this radiation coming out of materials, and she realized that it originates from within atoms, and yet it comes out with random properties. It comes out in a random direction and at a random time. And so she observed nature behaving randomly on the tiniest of scales uh, that they could see at the time. That was very mysterious because no physical picture of atoms incorporated any notion of randomness at that time. And in fact, these were the first clues to quantum behavior. Because quantum theory, as you may know, only predicts probabilities. It says nothing is strictly uh, definite. Or generally, nothing is definite. But uh, most things, one can only predict probabilities. So for this, I think uh, Marie Curie should be remembered as the originator, or, or one of the first uh, originators of the idea of quantum. Because according to quantum theory, a particle, even if you imprison it inside an atomic nucleus, can escape with some probability at some random time. And the reason is that in quantum theory, everything, every particle, is exploring all of its possible positions all the time. There's nothing you can do to prevent it doing that. And so Marie Curie was really one of the founders of her understanding of the quantum world. Well, today, quantum physics is taking us very much further. In the past, it's given us things like the transistor and the LED, but right now, we are busy trying to make much more sophisticated devices. Uh, quantum computers, which will exceed the power of any conceivable digital computer. They succeed by directly using the most uh, fundamental and bizarre aspects of quantum mechanics, what Einstein called spooky action at a distance. Even sooner, we're going to see quantum communications using satellites which will be immune from eavesdropping or hacking because if anyone does eavesdrop or hack, their presence would automatically be known. And so because this exploits quantum entanglement or spooky action at a distance, we've put Einstein there and made him look a little bit spooky too. Well, quantum technologies, which are now on our horizon, are extremely promising and interesting. One of them is quantum sensors, which would measure uh, our health and our environment and detect concentration of various chemicals with exquisite precision. These technologies will enable us to look after ourselves and our planet in ways which hitherto have not been possible. Another of my great uh, heroes is somebody who, who is rather unsung uh, except at Perimeter Institute. <laughs> and that is Emmy Noether. She was born in Germany, and when she was 18, she went to university to study mathematics. At that time, they didn't allow women to do mathematics in her university, and so she was allowed to audit the classes, but not to take a degree. So she completed the course, and finally persuaded them to let her take the exam, which she did, and she passed with flying colors. And so very reluctantly, they granted her the first ever degree of a woman uh, taking maths at that university. And she went on to do a PhD, and they even allowed her to teach. But because they did not employ any female professors in the university, they never paid her. <laughs> but she continued anyway, she persevered, and she was responsible for many very important breakthroughs in, in science. One of them bears her name, the Noether Theorem. So the Noether Theorem I thought I would illustrate with a simple demo as well. So I need an assistant. The Noether Theorem says that if a physical system has some symmetry, like this object under rotation, that there will be associated with that something which is conserved, 
something which is a constant. Okay? So if I throw this, then you can... <laughs> we didn't practice that, I promise you. <laughs> Natural talent. Um, when you throw that circle, because the circle is perfectly symmetrical under rotation, it turns out that the velocity with which it rotates is absolutely constant as, uh, as the circle rotates. Whereas, if I pick something more complex, like this lumpy object, which is a PI mug, then uh, if I throw that, the motion is much... <laughs> You notice that its motion is much more irregular, and you can't say that it's turning perfectly um, in, in anything like such a simple way. So, Nertha understood that symmetries have this very profound consequence, that there's an associated quantity which is constant. And in particular, she understood why there is something called energy, and why it's constant, why it's conserved. And the answer turns out to be because basically the world is pretty much the same from one moment to the next. If we forget about the expansion of the universe and very big scale things, the, the, the world around us is the same from one day to the next and this directly translates into the conservation of energy. And I think you'll agree that's a pretty amazing thing. Energy is an abstract notion. What is energy? Well, Emmy Nertha understood what it is conceptually. And it's the same for momentum and electric charge and many other quantities which are fundamental in physics. But she's remarkably unrecognized, even though her ideas helped to lay the foundation for all of 20th century physics, which became a search for these symmetries. So at Perimeter Institute, uh, we've created fellowships and programs in her name to encourage young women to enter science and to feel more supported. Because science, and physics in particular, really benefits from diversity. Diversity of people, of ideas, of cultures, and their interaction. Nobody should be excluded from science because of their background. Uh, it's to everyone's benefit that the brightest and most able people from whatever culture and background they come should be able to enter and progress. I mean, Nertha was notorious for always being surrounded by students, and she would have fit in wonderfully at Perimeter, because the whole building is full of blackboards and sofas and 24-7 coffee, all in the service of promoting interaction and discussion. People often have the wrong impression of basic science, and especially physics. They think of it as a solitary pursuit. They imagine Einstein as a lone genius toiling away in isolation until his miraculous idea emerged. Well, actually, nothing could be further from the truth. Einstein was influenced by and inspired by many, many other people. His ideas didn't spring from nowhere. They were based on those of others. In particular, he had two very close friends. Marcel Grossman on the left, who was a mathematician and taught Einstein the mathematics of curved spaces, exactly what he needed for his theory of gravity. And Mikhail Besso on the right, who was an engineer and interacted a lot with Einstein to figure out how to describe observation in special relativity. And Einstein's graphic pictures of this using trains and rulers and clocks were an outcome of his interaction with Besso. Science is all about collaboration, this combination of ideas and individual contributions brought to fruition by collaboration. Well, one of the greatest examples of collaboration is the team who just won this year's Nobel Prize in physics, the Laser Interferometer Gravitational Wave Observatory. This is an instrument built to test Einstein's theory and they made what I call the discovery of the century. Einstein's theory of gravity was first published in 1915, and this discovery didn't happen until 2015. So Einstein had realized, just like Maxwell did, that gravity would also have waves. As Maxwell figured out, 
electric and magnetic fields, and they travel together as waves. Einstein figured out how gravity works and also realized there should be gravitational waves. But at the time, he thought their detection would be hopeless. They're very, very weak effects, unbelievably weak, and Einstein thought they would never be measured. In fact, for 50 years, everyone agreed with him, and nobody bothered to think about it. But then in the 60s, some very brave souls realized that if you made the ultimate precision quantum measurement, you might be able to detect the very, very tiny changes in length which result when a gravitational wave passes through the Earth. And so after 50 years of development of this idea, and after they assembled a team of thousands from many countries, the advanced LIGO detector consisting of these two telescopes was turned on. And almost immediately, it worked. It detected a signal coming from two black holes merging 1.3 billion years, light years, away from Earth. Here it is. And so the two black holes are drawn together by their gravitational attraction, and as they come in, they spin off these waves, waves, disturbances in space, and then they merge into a single larger black hole. The process is quite quick, shorter than a second, and you now see this pulse of gravitational waves traveling out through space. So that happened 1.3 billion years ago, when the only things alive on the Earth were bacteria and algae and, and a few fungi. Okay, and then it traveled for 1.3 billion years, and just, just as people had built an instrument to see it, it was detected. Here's the detection shown in a graph and converted into an audio signal. The chirp is that pulse of gravitational waves crossing the detector. It's repeated. So I think you can imagine that pulse traveling through space for 1.3 billion years uh, to make that little chirp in the detector. And of course, the theory and the experiment matched perfectly. It was an absolutely stunning success. I'll never forget the day when the LIGO results were announced. We watched it in the Pyramid of Bistro, and you can see the atmosphere. People cheered, people laughed, people cried. We felt like we'd been given a new pair of eyes because we realized that all kinds of things we never imagined seeing we would now see. I'm particularly thrilled myself because gravitational waves will allow us to observe the Big Bang and answer Margaret Carney's great question. Okay, so I hope I've given you a picture of the progress of science, of the importance of uh, collaboration, and of the amazing things uh, we can now do. So I want to talk a little bit about Perimeter and about Canada. I was actually drawn to Perimeter by the opportunity to create a center which promotes these four C's. Curiosity, creativity, courage, and collaboration. And I think you've seen many examples of those in all the scientists I've shown you. And why Canada? Well, Canada's a very unusual place. Perhaps it's the vast beauty of the land, the openness of the spaces, the harshness of the seasons and the struggles that our predecessors had to go through. And probably it's a combination of all these things which is inspiring. It's, an, it's literally a vast open space. And uh, that's very encouraging of big thinking and bold, ambitious ideas. We're all aware of the opportunity in Canada to create a place, a sort of haven of hope for the world in which young people feel they have the space and the support to think big and to think free. And one of the things I want to emphasize personally is that we have to support those young people and we have to encourage them not to be afraid of failure. 
I can speak very personally about this because as a theoretical cosmologist, most of the ideas which I've explored have been proved wrong. <laughs> okay. um, I often console myself with the thought that at least they could be proven wrong, <laughs> unlike many other theories people talk about. <laughs> but to fail is to learn, and it is far better to know than to live with an illusion. In any case, when you do fail, we always have the endless inspiration of the natural world around us. There's nothing more compelling and inspiring than nature. Let's think, for example, of the autumn leaves, which gather sunlight and convert it into energy and create the oxygen which we all breathe. One of the wonders of photosynthesis is that, as recent discoveries show, it exploits the quantum behavior of large molecules to transmit energy from where it's received to where it's stored in sugar with extreme efficiency. And so, for this reason, and also because of their shape, the maple leaves remind me of Psi. And Psi is that same old symbol, but you can also use it as a handy mnemonic for the four qualities which I've talked about. Curiosity, creativity, courage, underpinned by collaboration. And I want to encourage you to look a little bit closer at Psi as well. You'll see in its middle an eye, and that's about you. And you should think about that as your, yourself, your own inspiration and ideas. But if you think about the rest of the top half, it's a W. An I is always stronger when it's part of a we. And so this symbol really captures something about uh, who we are and how we can be innovators. So I want to thank you all for listening to me tonight. And I want to encourage you that uh, amidst all the noise and confusion and antagonisms, we should never lose our optimism and our confidence that we can share and make sense of and improve our world because we are innovators. Thank you.